Good morning. Good morning. I'm going to invite you to find your seat. We're going to get started momentarily. It's almost time. Well, hey, good morning. How we doing? Good to see you. Yeah, I just came back from vacation, so pardon the shirt. <laughs> well, let's stand together. If you're joining us online, welcome. Psalm 95 says this, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise, for the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Amen? Let's sing together. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grave. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. Gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will see that our God saves. of the Spirit, Lord, we come, we're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace, hear the joyful sound of our offering, as your saints bow down, as your people sing, we will rise with you, lifted on your wings, and the world will
sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that yes the world will see that our god saves our god saves there is hope in I'm going to invite Keith to lead us in victory in Jesus. Amen. Good old-fashioned song. Let's hear it for God. <laughs> Woo! Amen. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came
one more time. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Amen. Yeah. You may be seated. And Gunther, where are you? Come on up and pray for us, my brother. Our Father, O oh God, you are the creator of all things. You spoke everything into existence. You are marvelous. We adore you, Father. You are so great that the scriptures say that the earth, that the heaven is thy throne and the earth is thy footstool. Father, you are filled with mercy and grace and love as only you can. And Father, as we worship you this morning in song, we worship you in prayer. We worship you in the preaching of the word, your perfect word, Father. And we, we simply ask that as your messenger comes to give us that word, Father, that the Holy Spirit wash over us so that we may fully understand what you have for us, for the message that you hear for us. May we have spiritual ears to hear, Father, everything you have for us. And Lord, this morning we pray for all those who are not here and all those who are missing, Father, those who are not here. Lord, we pray for their health, for their welfare. But Father, we pray most of all that the Lord Jesus Christ would touch their hearts at some point, Father. We ask all this in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Well, you guys can remain seated. We're going to sing a song called Behold our God. Behold our God who's seated on the throne. Sounds a lot like Gunther's prayer. Let's worship him this morning. Who 
Jesus felt the nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man. God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to reign. singing with us. We're going to sing a song called You Are My King. It's been a while, but it's a beautiful song that most of us know. Let's sing.
get our Bibles out. Let's turn to 1 Peter. Just to start with a, a special thank you to our worship team, our band, and all the guys and ladies in the crow's nest. Yeah, they get here extra early every Sunday and practice well to make sure things are decently and done in order for our church congregation. So uh, thank you guys for all the work you guys to, to serve us. Yeah. No, no baby yet, but please be praying that tomorrow the baby would show up. If for no other reason, I have a bet with Christy, and tomorrow's the day to make me the winner. So let's be praying that direction. Well, please grab your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter 4, and can we stand together out of reverence for God's perfect, holy, and inspired Word. 1 Peter 4, and this morning we're looking at verses 7 through 11 together. Let's hear what the Spirit has for us this morning. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift. Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks... As one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, would you reveal just a sliver of your grace and your majesty and your glory? in our minds, in our hearts this morning, that the beauty of these words written by our brother Peter two millennia ago could find open and willing hearts and minds, that the, the beauty of what you're calling us to, not just as your adopted sons and daughters, but sons and daughters who are living in beautiful, deep community together. Father, may, may these verses be true of each one of us individually and, and us corporately. We may, may we be in our city, in our town, in our area, an example of, of a church that loves the gospel and loves to live it out in all the ways that you encourage us. And Father, if there's anyone here who does not know your son, may they see the beauty of Christ, the beauty of the community that they are called, they're invited to participate to. And Father, may they bow the knee this morning and come to Christ alone for salvation. We ask this in the name of Jesus and Father, for your glory alone. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. During the 12th through 14th centuries, what we call the Crusades, took place. It involved hundreds of thousands of soldiers over hundreds of years. Uh, eight major waves of soldiers marching with one purpose in mind, to conquer and take back Jerusalem from the Muslims and from the Jews. For some on this warpath, their motivation was salvific. Uh, various popes convinced the people if they could go on a crusade, they could win back Jerusalem, uh, an automatic free pass to heaven, right? Not a bad deal. Not a bad deal at all. Others were looking to get rich uh, by all of the ransacking they could accomplish along the way, uh, maybe cut out for themselves a nice little sliver in the Holy Land. Uh, some were fighting for the glory and the honor of the Holy Roman Empire, while others were just mercenaries uh, looking to make a little extra quick cash as they fight along the way. But friends, the real reason for, for the Crusades had nothing to do with these reasons. There was another underlying epic reason why the pontiffs, the cardinals, were encouraging people to go to war and to fight to take back Jerusalem. This was a belief from the top all the way down to the laymen in the pews. It was a belief that once Christians had conquered and taken back Jerusalem for Jesus then Jesus could return. That would usher in the end of the ages. Jesus would come back and reign over a, a new kingdom centered there in Jerusalem. Now, during the Crusades, sadly, all sorts of bad actors did all sorts of bad actor things, and they committed those atrocities thinking they could get a, a straight-to-heaven card. But notice that the primary motivation for the Crusades wasn't salvation, it wasn't glory, it wasn't riches, it was a particularly bad interpretation of the book of Revelation. It was a bad view of the end times, of eschatology, of what has to take place before Christ can return that created an environment 
where Christians were on a crusade to conquer and take back Jerusalem. This view said that Jesus was just in heaven, um, twiddling his thumbs, waiting for Christians to do the heavy duty of taking back the city, and then he could show up and he could finish the job himself. Now, thankfully, this is not a popular view anymore, but we still see today what happens when folks have a bad view of Revelation, a bad view of the return of Jesus Christ, and do some crazy things with it. Maybe you've seen the guys wearing the the double-sided sandwich board with crazy hair yelling down a microphone. The, The end is near, and every once in a while, another cult will pop up, another group of individuals believing crazy things about the end times, that Jesus and Elvis are going to fly by an asteroid and beam up everyone dressed like a chicken, right? We see these cults, and they've been going around for 2,000 years, showing up, convincing people to turn away from the gospel and encounter a new way of viewing what's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns. But it's not only the crazy things we have to be aware of. There's also real genuine issues we see in Christianity that do things with the end times that they should not do. Sadly, some Christians seem to spend more time uh, reading their newspapers to figure out what's going on versus reading their Bibles. Some go so far as to say, since Jesus is coming back, we can just abuse uh, and neglect God's good creation. And we know what that sounds like. Cut down all the trees, uh, pump out all the chemicals, eat all the animals. Like Nothing really matters because Jesus is going to come back and it's all going to get burnt up uh, anyway. So who cares? For some folks, the danger can be meditating on the end times becomes the all-consuming thought all day, every day. Their only focus ignores the rest of the books of the Bible to focus on on just one, to the detriment of their own soul. And what we've seen over the millennia is some Christians try to figure out the exact date and time. And thankfully, so far, they've been wrong every single time. Like, what happens to happen so that Jesus can come back and bring in the new creation? And there's also the opposite danger. Many of us, we see what's going on over here. We see the crazies. We see the various neglects and abuses. So the temptation for us to say, you know what? That's above our pay grade. It's too hard. It's too complicated. So we're functionally going to live as though Jesus is not going to come back at all. And friends, that also is a danger for our, our souls. One of the amazing things, even in the early church, this was an issue that plagued these early believers. We see Christians quitting their jobs living off the goodwill of their church community, saying, hey, you know what? Since Jesus is coming back, I can quit my job. I can just live on the early retirement because he's going to come back any day now. We, saw, we see Christians not even living out their basic responsibilities. I don't need to pay my bills. I don't need to disciple my kids. I don't have to sow seeds today so I can reap the harvest tomorrow. Invariably, on biblical views of the end times, made many of these early Christians just lazy. They just gave up trying because, you know what, Jesus is coming back, so it doesn't really matter. Ironically, this type of confusion ends up looking a lot like unbridled worldliness. Instead of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow or die, it was eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow Jesus returns. And it looked like the same pursuit of all of the passions of the flesh. So the same arguments we see in the early church, we've seen throughout all of church history. Some say, look, Jesus is coming back soon, so let's sin it up while we can. Others going on the offensive. Jesus is coming back soon, so let's take a sword and let's defeat those who will not bow the knee to Jesus. Others retreating entirely. Hey, Jesus is coming back, so let's not share the gospel with unbelievers. If they don't want him, fine. They can reap what they are sowing. Friends, there are all sorts of ways confusion about the return of Christ and the end times can mess us up. And here's the deal. I would love it. Personally, if, if revelation, eschatology, the return of Christ could stay in its lane and be its own small subset of our lives. But sadly, for good and for bad, it won't do that. Ultimately, whatever your view is about the return of Christ, it will resound and echo and impact many of the other areas of our life. If you have your Bibles, turn over a few pages to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. This letter was written um, nine months, maybe a year after the first, first letter of Peter, written to the exact same churches, encountering the same kinds of issues, and remarkably, they're still confused about what it is with Jesus, when he's coming back, what they should expect. So we're going to start reading chapter 3. Look down at verse 1 with me. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. 
In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires, and they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. And by the same word the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of of the ungodly, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in them will be exposed. Since all of these things are thus to be dissolved, here is the great question. What sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Friends, this is the purpose. He says in verse 16, but according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The issue many have today is the same issue many had in Peter's day, is they're looking and they're watching and they're saying, where is this Jesus fella? You guys have been saying for 2,000 years that he's going to show up. He's not shown up yet, and I don't think he's ever going to show up. Friends, that same issue that many have today is the same issue that Peter was dealing with in his day. We know what that looks like. You can look at the authors of the New Testament, and you can look at their words, and you can misinterpret them and think they actually thought Jesus was going to show up while they were still alive. So let's look at the language. Let's meet these people where they are. Hebrews 1 says this, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. 1 Corinthians 10 says this, Now these things happened to them as an example But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. 1 John says this, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. 2 Timothy, Paul says this, but understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Acts 2, and in the last days it shall be, declares God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So where do we go with this? I would say the New Testament authors are clear. They believed that they were living in the last days, in the last hours, in the end of the ages. However, they definitely were not saying that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime. That completely misunderstands the language they're using and what they are ultimately trying to say. Now, they hope it's true. They hope that Jesus is coming back. And every time they write to churches, they're encouraging them to remember Jesus is coming back. He can come back right now. He can come back today. Be prepared. Be ready. But while they did not know when he was coming back, they knew that they were living in the last days. Now, let's be clear. If they all are saying that, If all the apostles and all the leaders of the churches were saying that Jesus was coming back in their lifetime, they got it wrong, and we should treat them the way we do every other heretic and scoundrel who comes up with another date of of the coming of Jesus Christ, right? If they got that wrong, then we should assume they got everything else wrong. That's an appropriate response. But friends, that is not what they've been trying to say. That completely misunderstands the focal point and the purpose of their writing. Here's what they're saying. Jesus through his life and his death and his resurrection, has ushered us into the last days. He inaugurated the coming of the kingdom of God. What theologians call the already, but not yet. What did he do? He he planted his church. He sent his Holy Spirit. He brought fulfillment and completion to the old covenant. And now we are in the final age, the church age. 
So one way we can think about our Bibles, that division between the Old Testament and the New Testament is this. That the Old Testament covers primarily the Old Covenant, the, the days of promise. The New Testament primarily covers the New Covenant, the days of fulfillment. The one thing Scripture is clear on when it talks about the last day or, or the capital D, the day of the Lord, that is the moment that Christ returns. That is the moment he brings a new creation and all will stand and be judged by their creator. But when the authors speak of the last days, the final days, the end of the ages, the last hours, he's referring to this present age, the time between Jesus' first and second coming. And here's the deal. The authors of the New Testament put a great weight and importance that Christians understand that we are living in this age, this age that Jesus has brought to us. And the one thing that's amazing, almost every time they bring this up, their primary purpose is to encourage Christians to live lives of personal holiness. As Paul says in Romans, the night is far gone, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. As Peter said earlier, since all these things are but thus to be dissolved, he doesn't say um, everyone buy a hunker, a hunker down in a, in a tunnel beneath your house or get a lot of cans of food and vegetables and survive the apocalypse. No, what does he say? He says, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? 1 John 3 says this, Beloved, we are, not, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. And he says this, And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So here in this letter we're looking at, Peter picks up these same themes of holiness-driven anticipation awaiting the return of Jesus Christ. That is the purpose of what Peter's writing. Look, look down, verse 7 with me. He says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So notice, friends, what is absent in these verses. Jesus is coming back, so run around with a sandwich board screaming down the end of a microphone. Right? He doesn't say that. Quit your jobs and live off the forced kindness of your church community. He doesn't say that. You know what? Stop paying your bills. Stop cutting your grass. Or in Modesto, maybe stop watering your grass. Man, he doesn't say that. What does he say? He says, since the end of all things at hand... Since we are living in the last days, since Jesus could return at any moment, pray for each other, love each other, show each other undiluted grace, be deeply and sacrificially hospitable to each other, serve one another. Jesus is coming back, so be a holy people ready for his return. Don't miss this, friends. Almost every time the scriptures encourage us to the return of Jesus Christ, its purpose is to make us more like Jesus Christ, not to entrance our imaginations with what might happen at the end times. The purpose of the return of Christ is that we might be holy. And the question we have to ask ultimately, friends, is why? Why these five areas? I think we have to look to Jesus. What is his job? What is he doing right now full time? He is praying for us. He is loving us. He is showing us undiluted, unmerited grace. He is building us a new creation to be our home. And he is serving us with his life. This is what Jesus is doing. And so this is what we are called to do. So here's a warning for, for all of us, I think. If your view of eschatology, of the end times, of last things, or study of Revelation, does not drive you to this kind of living, praying, loving, serving, showing grace, being hospitable, if that is not the primary outcome of your view, then whatever it is you're doing, you're probably doing it wrong. And friends, I'm speaking this to myself. If your view of the end times does not drive you to say, man, I want to be more holy, I want to be more like Jesus, then you're doing it wrong. So let's look at these five areas. Verse 7, 
He says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Notice how Peter here quantifies and qualifies these prayers. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. If you want to have power in your prayers, if you want to influence present reality by having your creator work on your behalf, if you want to actually hear and respond to your prayers, the most important thing for you to do is be self-controlled and sober-minded. What does that mean? God ties our personal holiness with our power in prayer. God ties our personal holiness with our power in prayer. As James 5 says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. He reminded the men of this church, these churches earlier that if you do not love and honor your wife well, your prayers will be hindered. And then he didn't quote Psalms 43, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. If you're a follower of Christ here this morning, know that nothing mutes your voice before your father than your reckless abandon towards the passion of the flesh. Whatever area in your life, the spirit maybe right now is pressing in on that nerve. No, friend, that is a thing that God is saying, I don't hear what you're saying. If you don't love me enough to be holy, then I'm not going to respond. And I'm not going to serve you in the ways that you most desire. So what is the opposite? Friends, the more holy we become, the more like Jesus we strive to be, while never attaining perfection, the more God will hear and God will answer your prayers. And the more our prayers will be the kind of prayers that he delights to answer. You know this, friends. God wants to answer your prayers. It's not like you pray and God's like, fine, I'll give you a cookie if you'll just stop talking to me. The exact opposite. God is waiting. Jesus is on his throne next to the Father, waiting and imploring. He desires your prayers. He wants to give you what you want. But first, he demands your holiness. First, he demands your full allegiance. And then, then he will give you what you most need according to his perfect will. Don't miss this. If the prayer of a righteous Christian availeth much, then, friends, the prayer of an unrepentant Christian availeth nothing. Second, he encourages these Christians to love the community. Look at verse 8 with me. He says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. This Greek word here for earnestly can also be used to describe a horse running at full gallop or a runner straining at the finish line, just hoping to break that rope at the end. What kind of love is this? Friends, this is not a lame, stumbling, bumbling love that un unintentionally, aimlessly shows love for another. This is a focused, intentional, passionate, meaningful kind of love. The same thing Peter says in chapter 1. He says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Friends, this is not just general congeniality. This is more than just giving each other a warm handshake on a Sunday morning. Yes, please, let's do that. This is a kind of love that leaves its mark on the lives of others. I know this. The question we have to ask is not why aren't other people loving me in this way? The question we have to ask is, how am I not loving other people in this kind of a way? All right, this love will look different for every single one of us. But there is one way that this love is demanded to live out in our lives. Proverbs 10, 12 says this, Hatred stirs up light, strife, but love covers all offenses. James 5 says, Let him know, that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Again, look at verse 8. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. This did not negate the responsibility of confronting Christians who are in sin or wandering from the faith. It does not negate the practice of what we call formative and corrective church discipline. But friends, probably the single largest segment of the Christian life 
is showing this kind of love that says, I'm going to show you all the grace that I would hope to receive from you, all the grace I receive every second from my Heavenly Father. That's how I'm going to respond to you. It's a love that says, you're a sinner like me, so I'm going to love you the way I would hope to be loved. Again, this doesn't ignore the fact that we're all messed up people. It doesn't ignore the fact we all have weird quirks and strange personalities. It embraces it as being more true than we could ever know, and yet says, I want to show you the grace that God has shown me in Christ. Friends, if anything, we should always, always err on the side of this kind of grace. So friends, here's what's remarkable. There are really only two options for you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Option one, if somebody sins against you and it hurts you and you're offended, you can address it with that person. You can make an issue of that person and you can be reconciled which is a very good thing. And there are areas we are commanded to do that. But the second position, the majority position, the meals you and I need to eat all day, every day, it says, you know what? You did this against me. I don't know if you meant to or if you didn't. I don't know if you're trying to hurt me if you weren't. But you know what? I'm going to show you grace. I'm going to give you the kind of love that covers a multitude, a limitless number of sins. Friends, those are the only two options. So here's the deal. Like, you know you. You know the thoughts you have to yourself, the conversations you have maybe with others. Maybe some of us are still dealing with hurt other Christians have done towards us in our past. It's true. Like, you you were hurt, and you can't always achieve that kind of reconciliation. But you have really two options. Either you get to work through it, you get to deal with it, and seek repentance and reconciliation and give grace, or you get to say, you know what, for my half, I am choosing to forgive and as best as I can forget. I am no longer going to hold that thing over against you. And friends, and imagine, imagine what kind of community that would be where this kind of love is exercised by every member. Do you know you could walk into church and know that there is nothing hanging out? There's no things to deal with, there's no conflicts to resolve. Get friends, no church will ever live this perfectly. But friends, this kind of church would be. What a harmonious, unified congregation to be a part of, where no one comes in saying, what thing can I hold against other people in this church? No, it says, man, I'm going to show everyone as much grace as I possibly can muster up. So he shows us another way that love can live out. Look at verse 9 with me. He says, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hospitality is oftentimes very misunderstood in in Christian circles. It's usually loosely defined as Christians um, having others over to their home to prove how nice a house they have and how expensive a food they can afford to throw down on. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a nice house or having expensive food. You, some of you invite us to our house, and we live there. Uh, In the past, I've hung out with some very wealthy people who had beautiful mansions and beautiful food, and it was a great time, right? So please, throw down as much as you want to. It's great. And there's nothing wrong with hosting people in your home and giving them delicious food. Look, the early church, for the first like 300 years, there were no church buildings. So most churches, for the first few hundred years of the church, only met in whichever member of the church had the biggest, largest, nicest house. They would meet in a Sunday evening gathering. They would meet in their main central courtyard. They would eat a meal together, and they would enjoy worshiping together. Don't miss the the major patron, the major location where every church met for 300 years was whichever member of the church had the largest, nicest house, right? The goal is not to take personal praise through it, not to adore yourself through your, your wealth, but if you have a nice house, use it for the glory of God, right? That's what we did for 300 years before we started building our church buildings. And know this, every letter of the New Testament was primarily read when? At the gathering of the church on a Sunday night, in whichever church member had the largest courtyard, wherever the most amount of people could fit in, right? So there's a beautiful picture there. But sadly, these days, I think an improper definition is being lived out when Christians say, I can't have people over to my house. I can't exercise hospitality because my house is too small, or it's not very clean, or I can't afford expensive food. Again, in some, some circles, it seems a defining feature of hospitality is lavish opulence. Know this, friends. Biblically speaking, hospitality has nothing to do, nothing to do with the quality and quantity of your house or your food. Biblical hospitality has nothing to do 
with the level of wealth or income or how nice your house is or how nice the food is you're serving your guests. Friends, nothing to do with it. The beautiful thing of hospitality is all of us can do it. Any one of us can do it at any moment in time. There's one example I always like to give. Biblical hospitality looks like this. A poor slave can have their wealthy masters over to their house for a a, a dry piece of fish and some crusty bread, and their masters can leave that house feeling filled with the love and genuine compassion they received from their slaves. Friends, that's a biblical view of hospitality. It's not on location. It's not on the spread. It is on the heart, the love you have for one another. This is what the gospel is getting at. And know this, friends, the call to hospitality doesn't apply to a subset of our church, those who are homeowners, or to the females in the church. Friends, hospitality applies to every single one of us. One of the amazing things in 1 Timothy 3, it says this, therefore an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and able to teach. In the Apostle Paul's mind, the qualification for an elder is just as important that they are hospitable as they are respectable and able to teach. This is how important hospitality was in the first century. So again, I hope you guys see this. This amazing drive of Peter, as he's encouraging these Christians, Jesus is coming back. We are living in the final days. And what does that mean? Meaningfully love those who are in your community of faith. Friends, what an amazing elevation of the local church, of what we are doing right in here. He's not saying love people generally, pray for people generally, be hospitable as much as you want to. He says, no, for those who are in your church family, this is how I want you to be. This is how I want you to love and serve and give to one another. And that's what we see in verses 10 through 11. He says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves, as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So Peter here lists these two main categories of serving the community, word and deed. And all of the gifts, call them miraculous, charismatic, spiritual, all of them, friends, fall under the category of either word or deed. Whoever speaks, one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves, one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Uh, the Apostle Peter, or Apostle Paul uses a similar word, deed, construct in Colossians 3. He says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. In the New Testament, there are five listings of what we call the spiritual gifts. And amazingly, they are all different. So what some have done mistakenly, I think, is they gather those five lists of the spiritual gifts They delete all the duplicates and say, these are the spiritual gifts. Now, I think that's a huge mistake. The point there's five lists, and the point that they're all different tells us there is a limitless, infinite number of ways that God can gift you to serve the body of Jesus Christ. So the primary purpose is not for you to take a test and figure out what your gifts are. The purpose is for you to, to serve the church in any way you can, and you figure out when Jesus returns what all the gifts were that he has given you. What's the point? The point is as Good stewards of God's varied grace. Friends, God gives the gifts as he deems fit, but the gifts are not for you. The gifts are for you to serve the body of Jesus Christ. Peter then concludes with one final powerful word of praise. He says, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is one of those beautiful expressions of doxological praise. He's giving these Christians the purpose of why they pursue these things, why they pray for one another, why they loving one another, why they showing grace to each other, why they being hospitable and serving one another, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Friends, maybe one of these five areas you'd acknowledge is, is lacking in your life. I mean, you feel the Spirit working right now, bringing some conviction. Say, man, I need, need to be more hospitable with what God has been, given me. I need to show more grace to those who don't love me and serve me in the ways that I most crave. Friends, I encourage you, let the Spirit do its work. Figure out where, where He's leading you and guiding you, and let Him make you more like Jesus Christ this morning. Uh, one meaningful way I think we can live these things out is in the 
In a couple of months, we're going to be starting up our community groups. And what does that look like? A whole lot like what we just read. Small groups of meeting in homes, enjoying fellowship together, breaking bread together, praying for one another, loving one another. That's the design and the purpose. Why? So we can be ready for the day of the Lord. And if you're not a member of a church, we like our church here. We encourage you. To, the only way you can meaningfully live out these commands is by being a covenant member of a church. And we encourage you. Next month, we're having our new members class. Man, join the class and covenant yourselves with this body of believers. Finally, maybe for some of us, if we're honest, our, our emphasis on end times is off kilter. As we think through it, as we meditate on it, as we process what is going on when Jesus returns, we're, we're entranced and enticed by what is mystical and difficult, and we, we lose ourselves in the details, and we miss a life of holiness. Again, see this vision. The authors of the New Testament are clear. We are living in the last days, so be like Jesus Christ. Love your church well. Romans 6 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Maybe some of us this morning have never turned to Christ in salvation. Maybe you find it easy to scoff at the idea of the return of Jesus. He's on his way, and you stand condemned in your sins, and you'll be found guilty on that day. May you turn to Christ alone for salvation. Church, we are living in the last days. Therefore, what sort of people ought we to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Let's pray together. Father God, would you help us to be the kind of individuals, the kind of church that is looking for, anticipating, hastening the day of the return of your son. May we look forward to it longingly, but Father, may we not end there. May we be enticed May we be drawn towards the beauty of your church, of loving your body way, well as, as the way in which we prepare ourselves for the return of Jesus Christ. Father, for some of us, may we, we ignore this aspect. We live functionally as though Jesus is not coming back. Father, may the glory and the anticipation that today, in this very hour, Jesus might return. Father, may it drive us to holiness and Father, as we think through and meditate on the sins of former generations, where they've made missteps of what the end times mean, what we should think about the revelation of your son returning, Father, may, may we see that. And Father, may we be glad for the place we have. We can see those missteps. But Father, ultimately, we rest where Peter encourages us. As we wait the day, as we hasten the day of the Lord, Father, may we love our church community well. And may we love you well as we pursue lives of holiness. We ask this all in the name of Jesus and for your glory alone. Amen. 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 Church, let's stand together and let's respond in worship. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a classic old hymn called Blessed Be the Tie. So would you join us? Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, church. Well, if you're a guest with the Willow Community OABC, if you would, fill out the Connect card and a seat back in front of you and drop it in the offering box at the back. We'd love to have a record of your visit and a chance to get to know you better. Well, as I mentioned last week, the deacons and pastors have been talking over the last few months for uh, a vision for the ministry of OABC this fall as we open up out of the COVID pandemic. And so the two things we want to encourage you to see is our community groups and our equipping class. Uh, this is something that we're going to try from August through November, and at the end, we will evaluate and we will adjust um, accordingly. So our community groups will be on the first and third Sundays of each month uh, in Sunday evening. And they'll be gathering in homes. So as you step out into the foyer this morning, you'll see a map set up, uh, various of our community leaders. So we have 10 leaders with four groups right now. So they're scattered uh, north side, south side, central, and east. And so if you have the time and the willingness, if you want to kind of live out some of the very, very things that Peter is encouraging us to this morning, I think this is a great place to do that. Again, so it's going to be a time of fellowship, of encouragement, of prayers. This isn't a Bible or book study. And of course, there will be delicious food. I am positive of that. So if you're interested, we're starting up in a couple of months. You can go in there and you can sign up. So if there's community groups that you know or you like these leaders or it's closer to your house, you can sign up for that. And as we move forward in a, in a couple of weeks, we'll let you guys have, have more details for that. Uh, these aren't designed to take up your entire Sunday evening. So we're looking about an hour and a half total, just a time of fellowship, small groups in homes, uh, trying to love each other other well. And the other thing is the equipping class. That will be the second Sunday evening of each month. That's going to be higher level training discipleship. We'll probably meet in here. We'll have some handouts. And this fall, we'll be looking at uh, how do we study and apply the Bible? How do we interpret it? What are the guardrails that God has given us to understand what a text means and how it applies um, to our life? So I encourage you guys, to be, as you go towards the fall, again, this, if the Spirit is pressing, this might be a good idea for you. You can sign up. You can try it for a week. And if you don't like it, you don't have to come back. But my hope is that you'll try it and you will enjoy it and enjoy it more and more. Well, our brother Mike Ferrante is going to come now, pray for us, and dismiss us in prayer. Well, I don't see Mark, so I want to invite um, Mike. Mike. Come on up, Mike. Dear Heavenly Father, we are blessed and thankful to be in your house. We are in awe of your sacrifice, which was made for us on the cross some 2,000 years ago. As we consider the grace that has been given to us, may we grow in grace to others and develop godly practice and scripture purpose in our lives, so that you are lifted up in our hearts and glorified in all that we do. Please go with us as we leave your house and be with us and guide us in your will throughout the week so that we may be beacons of your love your grace your joy and your peace we ask these things in your holy and precious name amen